The Historical Committee of the Nashville Bar Association did not produce this program on Baker versus Carr to be kind to its members. Others have already accomplished that. The legacy of one man, one vote, one person, one vote is well documented and many of the key players in that constitutional drama are still alive and able to articulate the soaring principles that guided them to the United States Supreme Court 50 years ago. In this historic anniversary year, we felt it would be important for the next generation of lawyers and the generations who will follow them to be aware of this proud and defining moment in their history. Therefore, with the help of many loyal NBA members, we present the true story of how a cadre of young lawyers changed the political landscape of Tennessee and the nation by standing on principle and having no fear of the entrenched political powers of their day. It is a story filled with poignant moments and capped by a legal triumph as yet unmatched in Nashville bar history. We hope you enjoy it. is unconstitutional. We seek that. We think that uh, the history of the matter is that these uh, <coughs> speculations that the legislature might set in eye of the district court are uh, out of order. They're not borne out by uh, what actually has happened, where reapportionment has been ordered or where an act of apportionment has been held unconstitutional. And, and in effect, uh, they are um, a departure from the judicial presumption, which is that other officials will follow the law if the law is laid down to them. Uh, in, in a uh, substantial way, uh, they slander the people that Tennessee might next elect to its legislature. And so we say that uh, the, these matters that are uh, uh, pointed up um, they're not supported by presumption. We're not entitled to presume that the state legislature would, if this act of apportionment uh, were struck down, that it would sit and refuse to do anything. Maybe, maybe to presume that it will fail as close to the line of selfishness as it thinks is justified. The and that will make a change from, say, from two-thirds, from two-thirds to one-third to... to three-fifths and two-fifths. And you would then be here again, wouldn't you? Well, wouldn't you? if employed to come, yes. <laughs> I would be hopeful. <laughs> I, never, I, don't, I don't know if there's a basis on which to get employed and win a lawsuit. Yes, if, would you be uh, here again? We would try to be here again because, uh, as the Attorney General says, this is a long-standing a continuing evil and a weakness in uh, our system of government. Yes, but if you if you start with the assumption with which the Mr. General, Mr. General of the United States started, that there may be differentiation and not equality between urban and rural representation, then the Tennessee legislature may act on that assumption and think three fifths as against as against two thirds might satisfy the Supreme Court of the United States. Couldn't they conscientiously think that? He says only rational 
differentiation. As you have seen from questions asked by other of your associates, in this particular apportionment, no rational basis can be discovered. I understand that. Yes. I accept that. And I assume it's struck down, and it goes back to the legislature, and under the uh, that well-known deference that we witnessed in the South in many states, they would at once obey the law of this the decision of this court. They would pass a new apportionment act, changing the present proportion of two thirds to one third, to three fifths, and two fifths. And you would then be here because I'm confident you would be reemployed. Uh, and uh, wouldn't you? Yes, we would. But couldn't a legislature conscientiously think if there may be? If you please, a loading of urban is against rural against uh, <coughs> rural is against urban. That it is not a law of democracy that there be one vote, one man throughout the state. They may make a change which would again call into play this process of litigation, wouldn't it? I have no doubt of that. And yet, uh, against that, you have this, Your Honor, that the rotten borough and the gay man. Uh, it can never be defended by someone who believes in the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Uh, well, it all we... depends what your conception is of the function of a court. What you just heard was a Nashville lawyer arguing and winning the landmark case of Baker versus Carr in the United States Supreme Court. I will add, he did it in eight minutes of the total allotted time. Baker versus Carr is Nashville Bar's finest hour. It's our proud legacy. It's the story that will be told here today to celebrate the 50th anniversary of that decision. A citizen's most valuable right in a representative democracy is the right to vote. And of course, we've had a display of that this week. But that right is undermined if some votes count more than other votes because of apportionment. The Supreme Court had ruled in 1946 that legislative apportionment was a political thicket, a political thicket beyond the jurisdiction of any court. All that changed with Baker versus Carr. All that changed because of Nashville lawyers when the Supreme Court ruled in 1962 that courts could decide apportionment cases and thereby laid the foundation of what we call one person, one vote. It happened because of great lawyers from the Nashville Bar that you'll hear about and indeed see many of them here today. I want to make uh, some acknowledgments of special thanks to the sponsors of this event the Nashville Bar Association, the Federal Court Library Fund, the Napier Luby Bar Association, the Nashville Public Library, Waddy and Patterson, the Waller Law Firm, Sherrard and Rowe, Baker Donaldson, Bass Berry, Bone McAllister, Bradley Arant, Gullet Sanford, my former law firm, Leitner Williams, and Toon Endrican and White all contributed to putting this program on today, and we thank them. Finally, I also want to acknowledge uh, the Planning Committee and the Historical Committee of the Nashville Bar who um, got this started and made it possible under the leadership of uh, John Kitch, President of the Nashville Bar. And now I want to turn the program over to Ed Yarborough, a great Nashville lawyer in his own right, and he will begin the uh, substance of the program. Let me say, uh, by the way, that, that today's program will be perhaps a little different from uh, CLA programs that you've attended in the past. We not only have uh, a tremendous array of star lawyers as panelists, but we also have several of them captured on video. And throughout the presentation today, we'll be using the video to show you and the panelists so that they can react to some of the comments that these lawyers who actually participated in the case can, uh, can tell you uh, some stories, and I can guarantee you some of the stories are quite interesting, and give you an idea of what it was like to be involved in Baker versus Carr from a personal standpoint. In 1955, seven years before Baker versus Carr would be decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, a 28-year-old rookie legislator named Macklin Davis 
read the Tennessee Constitution and decided to file a bill requiring the state to apportion its General Assembly according to the 1950 census, and somehow that had not been done since 1901. Davis soon learned the difference between constitutional law and raw power. Democrat bosses in the House of Representatives ordered him to withdraw his bill. It turns out they were happy with the imbalance between rural and urban districts, and they had no intention of letting this young Nashville lawyer upset the apple cart. But Davis held firm. He said he had taken an oath of office to uphold the Constitution, and he planned to honor it. The result? His bill was defeated on second reading rather than on third reading, the usual time for a full vote, and no member of the Memphis delegation supported his bill, even though Big Shelby County would have benefited the most from reapportionment. To their credit, young lawmakers Ward DeWitt, Douglas Henry, and other members of the Davidson County delegation sided with Macklin Davis to the dismay of party leaders. This experience led Davis not to run again for the legislature, but rather support a movement to seek justice through the court system, which he was sure, where he was sure the law would be followed. Another lesson in political reality awaited him in the state courts. I introduced the bill to reapportion the legislation. And of course, I was a Democrat then in Davidson County. They didn't even have Republicans. I didn't, I, got a, I won the Democrat primary and the Republicans didn't even run any opposition against me in the general election. And when I introduced that bill, the party bosses complained and told me I should withdraw it immediately or it would be rejected on second reading. Well, usually it doesn't come up to a vote till third reading. I said, no, I took an oath to support the Constitution, which requires what my bill says, because the legislature hadn't been reapportioned in, in uh, 50 something years, and it's supposed to be done every 10 years. And they said, they were very critical of me for doing that. They said, the people elect us to represent them and to, because they know us and trust us to do what is best for them and they don't want us restricted by a constitution by any or other technicalities <laughs> and because uh, I thought they were wrong. <laughs> it hadn't been done in some 50 years and uh, anybody that voted against doing it and didn't introduce an apportionment bill himself was violating his oath to support the constitution and uh, the other five members of the Davidson County delegation agreed with me in, in the House. And they all voted on my side not to reject the bill. But the Democrat Party bosses got the others to vote to reject it. And there were eight members from, of the House from Shelby County, which would have benefited the most by the reapportionment. And all eight of those voted to reject the bill to reapportion the legislature and uh, it was rumored that they were uh, had to do what the crunk machine told them to do. <laughs> <laughs>